started, hello and welcome to our Interviewing in the Age of Zoom panel discussion. I am Jason Castillo, Associate Dean for Academic Affairs here at the College of Social Work. Uh, we are excited to have you join us virtually, or if you are watching this recording, uh, the recorded version of, uh, of our panel discussion. Before we get started with today's presentation, on behalf of the College of Social Work, I recognize the contributions of our American Indian community members by acknowledging that this land, which is named for the Ute tribe, is the traditional and ancestral homeland of the Shoshone, Paiute, Goshute, and Ute tribes. The University of Utah recognizes and rec respects the enduring relationship that exists between many indigenous peoples and their traditional homelands. We respect the sovereign relationship between tribes, states, and the federal government, and we affirm the University of Utah's commitment to a partnership with the Native nations and urban Indian communities through research, education, and community outreach activities. Today, we are pleased to welcome five of our agency partners to our interviewing panel discussion. These representatives have experienced valuable insights into the interviewing and hiring process for social workers across many different types of agencies. Boyd Manson has worked in child welfare for over 18 years with the Division of Child and Family Services as a caseworker, trainer, supervisor, and administrator. As part of his administrative work, he has overseen the hiring of all new employees for three years, during which he has interviewed hundreds of candidates. He graduated with a master's in social work from the University of Utah in 2020. Daniel Mulcahy is the director of substance use disorder treatment services at First Step House, where he manages substance use disorder clinical program managers, clinical staff, and recovery support staff. His previous work includes inpatient stabilization units, forensics units, crisis services centers, emergency rooms, conducting mental health and substance use assessments, as well as adult community outpatient programs. He earned his master's degree in psychology from the University of Central Florida in 2013. Kimber Perry, Perry is a population scientist for the Veterans Rural Health Resource Center in Salt Lake City. For the past several years, she has focused on research and other projects related to rural outreach, workforce, and mental health, with a special emphasis on moral injury and volunteerism. Kimber has also worked with the Social Work Student Education Workgroup for over a decade, including leading the student selection subgroup. Kimber graduated with a master's degree in social work from the University of Utah in 2012. Justin West has been with the University of Utah Health for five years, first as an onboarding specialist and now as a recruiter for behavioral and mental health positions, mainly social work and crisis work. Previously, he worked in human resources on active duty with the Utah Army National Guard. And finally, it is my honor to introduce Sonia Martinez-Ortiz, our moderator for today's panel. panel. Sonia is the executive director of the Rape Recovery Center. She is a woman of color, Chicana, Latin, Latinx, raised and living on Salt Lake City's west side, who acknowledges the spaces she occupies has always been in indigenous lands. Sonia has spent over 20 years integrating an equity, inclusion, and anti-oppression lens in her work. She has experience in nonprofit administration, grassroots advocacy, equity and inclusion strategies, community development, policy advocacy, and trauma work. Sonia has worked as an assistant clinical professor teaching undergraduate and graduate level social work courses. She earned her master's degree in social work from the University of Utah and a certificate in nonprofit management from Georgetown Center for Public and Nonprofit Leadership. Our panel will start by addressing some questions, some common questions regarding interviewing, including in-person and virtual interviews. Uh, then we hope to have time for a few audience questions. I'd like to let everyone know to please use the Q&A button at the bottom of your Zoom window to submit any questions you might have. So with that, Sonia, the floor is yours. All right, thank you. Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Castillo, for those introductions. Um, I know that I can probably speak for all of us here that we're really excited um, in talking about bringing on new social workers into our agencies and have a lot of feedback. There's been a lot of changes during this era of Zoom and COVID, and so I'm excited to learn from you all. I think um, the best way to start this off would just be for maybe if each of you could give us um, uh, a picture into what it looks like at your organization. What does interviewing at your agencies look like today? 
Um, anybody want to start first? Justin. I will kick us off. Yeah. <laughs> um, so uh, typically, um, a candidate, um, once they submit their application resume cover letter, um, uh, they'll go to our web page, they'll contact me one way or another. Um, but um, all of our application process is online, as I, I imagine most um, organizations are now. Um, that that application gets to me. I hand screen every candidate, uh, every resume. Um, I'm just making sure that um, from an HR standpoint that we're, we're checking off, off all the boxes. We're making sure that we're uh, meeting those minimum requirements for the job, our job codes. Um, I'll disposition the candidate uh, after I get their resume, review it, uh, have a typically screen that candidate via phone call. Um, if all of my ducks are in a row, sometimes I'll just uh, like they're they're great. I'll send it to the hiring manager for their review. Um, but it really, I'm just as a recruiter, I'm making sure that we're uh, meeting all of those compliance pieces. Um, yeah. And are you all um, are you doing in person, virtual, or a combination of both? A uh, combination. Yeah. So I've got uh, I typically work with uh, about. 30 hiring managers. Uh, so each one's a little different. Um, some will do uh, start off with that virtual interview. Um, it, for the most part, that's what our organization has been doing. So I will screen the candidates, send it to the hiring manager. The hiring manager will uh, set up a phone call, uh, usually uh, via Zoom or MS Teams, uh, just a virtual uh, so it sounds like some hybrid hybrid uh, processes that are going on there. Um, and then Daniel, I know that you were um, you had unmuted yourself as well. At first step house, what normally happens is the HR recruiter will go through the applicant's resume, usually have like a brief phone conversation just for screening purposes. Uh, after that screening session, then we usually try to schedule a second interview uh, with myself, probably two of the HR recruiters and the applicant, looking for really just uh, fit within the agency. And then normally after that, there's a third interview, which takes place with myself, uh, the program manager, and one HR recruiter, really looking at the fit of that applicant within the specific facility that has a position opening. Uh, after that, we normally have a few days before the HR recruiter contacts the applicant back and then lets them know what the next steps are. Great, and do you all engage in in-person, virtual, or a combination of both uh, for interviews? It's been a combination of both. Uh, the last three years, of course, it's been virtual, um, but as we are, kind of continuing to evolve with our COVID-19 response, we are getting back into in-person interviewing as well. Great. Um, Kim, Kimber? Yeah, sure. So uh, I refer the, the VA, so a very large national federal institution. So we have really um, very strict kind of um, uh, standardized processes for hiring. And so all, all candidates apply through what's called USA Jobs, and it's an online platform. And so um, candidates are then screened through HR, and it's a quite a process. You know, you don't have a lot of like interaction with those HR folks. So it's really important to have your, um, you know, your application, you know, all your T's crossed and I's dotted and really follow all of the, the um, requirements within the announcement because the chances of them like bouncing it back to you are not good. You'll probably just be kind of rejected and have to apply for the next thing. Um, and then once it makes it through the HR process, uh, um, uh, subject matter experts within social work will take a review of that, um, of the app potential applicants and then create what we call a, a cert. And then we'll go through the interviewing process through there. And so we use performance-based interview questions, uh, which are very, you know, standardized questions that really push um, people to look at their back, their past experiences to show how they could perform successfully in, in future uh, roles and obligations. Um, 
most of our interviews, I'd say at this point, are um, a hybrid approach as well. If, if we have a lot of candidates from across the country, and so um, in instances when people can't come to, you know, Salt Lake in person, we'll do them online. Um, and if there's an available kind of space and room for some positions, we'll do them in person. Um, I think it just kind of depends on the the hiring manager and and what um, you know what they're what they're going for and what their you know schedule allows for essentially. Great, thank you. And there is a follow-up question. Um, Justin, you had mentioned a disposition screening. Before I jump over to Boyd, uh, can you just expand on that a little bit? Sorry, yes, I just meant by uh, once I look at the applicant, um, if they're qualified, I will send them on. If they're not qualified, I will usually send out an email that just says, thank you for applying. Um, and that's typically a, a bachelor's level candidate applying for a master level position or something. Yeah. Okay, so it's just a step that maybe some agencies don't do, which is, and for those who aren't familiar with the term disposition, I just remember it from my court in DCFS days. It's like the result, the decision that comes out of it. So it's a, an initial um, decision that's made if someone already is not meeting the minimum requirements. Yeah, so some some uh, companies, will, their applicant tracking systems will do an auto sort, and I, however, they're going to sort those. Um, here with the University of Utah Health, um, I, I'm reviewing each one of those applications by hand. Great, thank you, Justin. Boyd. Yeah, so I work for Child and Family Services or DCFS. We have a pretty similar process to what a lot of these people have said. Uh, we have an HR analyst like Justin who gets the applications off of our state jobs website, statejobs.utah.gov, in case anyone's graduating. Um, and then they refer them to me or disposition them to me. And then I set up the interview. Uh, we are 100% virtual at this point. I can't imagine we'll go back. Uh, these are frontline positions, um, entry-level positions, and we've found that uh, doing them virtually is, is a lot easier for everyone. I contact them one of two ways, by phone or by text. I find text is now the most, it's the best way to get a hold of people. Since I've switched to text, I've gone from basically getting a hold of half the applicants to 100% of the applicants. So that's what we do. And then we bring people we bring people in, we do an interview. It's generally a small panel of two to five hiring managers, usually two. I'm on all of those. And then um, within a week, you know, we try to vet their vet their references and then make an offer. So that's kind of how we do it. Awesome. Well, I'm actually going to share a little bit about ours because it's a very different <laughs> than the other folks in the group. And I think this is actually really helpful to have a good mixture of different types of agencies. So in for the Rape Recovery Center, we're a, a small local nonprofit organization in Salt Lake City. And so we don't have an actual HR person and we don't have like an online application portal. So what we're doing is we're posting our jobs really via grassroots and social media um, and on our website. That's how we get the word out about when we have an open position. We always have them listed on our website, but we usually do kind of a grassroots spreading of the word that we're hiring. And then we ask for folks to submit some specific uh, application material. So it's usually a resume, a cover letter, and depending on the role, maybe a writing sample. So for example, right now we're not hire we're hiring for a therapist, but what we'd be asking for the therapist would essentially be a resume and cover letter. But if somebody was wanting to go into like a development role or um, prevention education role, we might be asking for like a writing sample or something like that. There's uh, directions in the job post about where you send that. We have a jobs email, it's jobs at raperecoverycenter.org. And then because we don't have an HR person, the hiring manager um, actually has a rubric that we screen applicants for to determine who will see for the first set of interviews. And then we usually start the first round of interviews with a hiring, a very small hiring panel that consists of the 
um, hiring manager, maybe a peer, someone who might be a peer on their team, and then somebody across the agency that they might have to collaborate on work or someone from our admin um, team. And it might be like three people would do that. And then we narrow that down uh, based on some, we have some really specific, they are behavior questions, but they're also really, really questions that get at our values as an organization to determine both behavior, but then also behavior and experience, but then also um, will they fit within the values? We are a uh, anti-oppression, anti-racist, feminist, multicultural led organization. And so we have some very non-negotiable values of all of our um, employees that we onboard. And we want to make sure that that's a good fit also for the person coming on, that they feel comfortable moving into an environment that might look different than some of the other places that they've worked. And then when that is, uh, when we, then we, we usually narrow that down um, to about usually three to four applicants for a second interview. And at the second er interview phase as the ED, I'm usually brought in at that process. Again, because our team's so small, it's just another way to make sure that anybody that staff are recommending to come on board align with the mission and the vision of the organization and where we see the organization going. And we usually will use an, a rubric for questions. So we really try to eliminate bias as much as possible, ask the applicants the same questions, make sure that we're kind of like, you know, grading or scoring them with the same perspectives. And we have a conversation about that. So that's what that process looks. We are also in kind of a, a hybrid uh, interview environment. So we usually do all first interviews via Zoom. And then second interviews, we do invite people to come in in person. But we've had several people who've applied for jobs that um, that doesn't work for one reason or, or another, including people living in other states who want to relocate and work for the Rape Recovery Center. So a little bit different. And I think that is um, something that I kind of wanted to, after hearing you all, I think it's important for students to know that tailoring their, you know, their, their materials and tailoring and their expectations, tailoring their expectations, because depending on the agencies that you're applying for, it might look different. So like Justin and I, right, we're like human beings are the first people that are seeing those resumes. And maybe in some of the other systems, there are some automated processes that are helping. So the way that you apply where you know that someone is physically seeing your application versus a system might look different in the way that you present your resume, et cetera. So those are just things to think about. Also working in a smaller organization versus a much larger organization, like First Step is now, I consider to be a much larger org even though I remember back in the day when it was a very small org. And then of course we have DCFS, which is, a, you know, it, it's a division within the um, Department of Health and Human Services. And so all of that looks different. And then the VA is national federal. So keep that in mind as you're searching for jobs, as you're, as you're going through the interview process and tailor your expectations based on where uh, you're applying. The other thing that I would love to ask you all is maybe considering we all have talked about most of us are in a hybrid, some in remote only uh, interview process, what tips can you give folks about uh, virtual interviewing? Boyd, do you want to go first? Sure. So I think some tips that I could give, one, look professional. You don't have to be dressed to the nines or in a tuxedo or anything, but look professional. Um, unless there's something, it, for example, sometimes we've been wanting to interview people and they've been on vacation and it fits our timeline. And we'll say, and I will say to them, I don't care if you're in a sweatshirt and jeans. You know what I mean? We don't care about, and, and I will let everyone on the panel know, but in, unless you're explicitly told, I would say dress for the position you want or maybe even one level above that position. Two, um, think about your background. How many people noticed this door is open? I don't know if any of you did, but I left it open on purpose so that I could make this point, which is things in your background can be distracting for people who are paying it, trying to pay attention to what you're saying, and it can distract them from what the point you're trying to make. 
So have your background be professional. That does, I mean, we know if it's virtual, you may be at home. It doesn't mean that you have to remove all artifacts of your life or anything like that. But I've seen distracting things, piles of laundry, um, unmade beds, um, family members running through. And, and some of that's pretty acceptable. But um, just be aware of that, I think, are a couple of good tips I would give. That is um, really great. And actually, it's kind of funny because when the panelists all joined, I apologized for the weird halo going on in the background. And, and it got worse when I blurred out my background. And so this is like cautionary to test your space at the time <laughs> that you're going to be on a Zoom meeting. Um, because even this that is in the background here, you, it's probably distracted some of you. So totally agree with you, Boyd. I think oftentimes just like a really basic wall, even like Kimber is sitting before can be uh, best case scenario, um, or like Boyd has mentioned, just kind of take a quick look behind you, blur out your background if you need to. Um, so thank you for that, because I, we, I, we both actually have some like visual examples of what not to do. And, and you see people with these like wild Zoom filters or Google Meet filters of space with a space alien in it. And okay, if you're doing that, to put forth that you're a fun and fun person, okay. But I would say in general, that's probably not the wisest way to do it because it distracts from you. Exactly. Um, Daniel. Uh, it's, it's everything that Boyd said, I would say, along with that, making sure you're on time, making sure that your microphone and your camera are working prior to the interview. A lot of times we start the interview process and then we're having to help figure out technological issues about the camera or the microphone. Um, making sure your background is either filtered or less distracting. Limiting distractions within your environment. So if you have maybe pets, if you're interviewing from home and you have pets running around, maybe kind of putting them in a separate room or you go to a different room so you don't have your dog walking in front of the camera or anything like that. Um, and then really just kind of staying focused and engaged throughout the entire process, making sure that you're not kind of referencing your cell phone or, or anything like that, because that often happens as well. Um, those are some of the the basic tips that I would have for virtual interviewing. Justin? Yeah, I, I would say just getting in early, set up your space. Um, I know that um, recently I've been having issues with Zoom and, and this uh, panel actually made me, I got in early. I was like checking my mic, checking my video settings, like just get in there early. Just make sure that uh, you're you're not doing troubleshooting instead of an interview. Um, just uh, some, some virtual eye contact, uh, knowing kind of where your cameras are. So, you know, um, in my space here, I've got three cameras. So just knowing which one I'm talking to is actually very important uh, because even though I may be completely engaged and I'm staring this way because I'm looking at my computer, that doesn't necessarily look like I'm engaged. So just, um, yeah, uh, virtual eye contact, I say. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Uh, Kimber? Yeah, so um, I would just double down on what everyone else has said so far. I would say generally it's better to overdress than underdress. If you're not sure, go more formal. Um, the other thing is just to be really communicative with whatever challenges you're facing, right? We all understand that life is crazy. And, you know, like um, Boyd had mentioned, if you're on vacation, things like that happen. I had one time um, uh, someone I interviewed with had was his wife was having a baby like that moment. And so he was like in a bathroom. Um, and so, you know, when we turned the camera on, there was like this, you know, this kid in a bathroom. We're like, oh, this is the weirdest interview I've ever done for sure. Because he was like sitting on the toilet seat, you know, so 
and then he like explained the scenario and we're like, oh, okay, of course, that, that makes sense. So just whatever, you know, challenges you're faced with, be communicative about them up front. Don't assume that we're just, that the interviewers know what's going on with you or, or that that's um, uh, clear with, with your environment and background. That's a great point, Kimber. I had a, a similar uh, people on trains trying to do an interview on a train. You, you can't hear the candidates. So trying to get all the information and trying to put all your focus in on that candidate is very difficult when you got all that noise in the background. And something that may seem obvious, but is not obvious, I've learned, is turn your camera on. Like double downing on all of the advice that is given, but have a working camera and turn it on. Um, Folks need to see you in interviews, and and I, I could get on a whole soapbox about that, about like groups and one on ones and all kinds of stuff. But just turn your camera on when you're meeting with people, um, because it it's important. <laughs> and then uh, the other thing that I will say is that I think it aligns with what everybody was talking about in terms of logging in early. But there, people you organizations and people use different tools uh, for virtual interviews. And so you may be really familiar with Zoom, and then you're asked to log into Google Meets. You may be very familiar with Google Meets, and then you're asked to, to log into, um, what's the one the county uses? WebEx, WebEx. So different entities have gone through different processes to get their systems approved. And so some of them might not work well in your browser and you might actually have to download the app. So getting in early to make sure everything works, but also don't assume you're going to be able to click on the link and get into where you need to get in. So, and your audio might change if you always use Zoom and now you're in WebEx, maybe your mic isn't connecting to the right system. Um, as Justin mentioned, I think it was Justin that said you have several cameras, like same with your audio. You might be using a different mic depending on how you're logged in. So, so be very uh, thoughtful about that. And then um, another question I would love for our panelists to answer for you all is what, what can people do, whether that's in the resume, uh, cover letter, in the interview, to set themselves apart from other applicants? Kimber, do you want to start first? Yeah, sure. So, um, like I mentioned, we do do performance based interviewing, and so um, it's really important that people speak specifically about experiences and not generally, right? I think the one of the biggest uh, downfalls that that people make are traditionally kind of speaking, oh, this is what I might do in this situation, or maybe if I was faced with this, I could potentially do this, but we were actually looking for an example, and so rather than like. I've done this generally in the past, kind of this is how I approach things. We'd like to hear, give us an exact example of a client that you've worked with and how you executed what you're saying. Um, so being really specific and really um, uh, clear can, can really set a great uh, tone for an interview. Um, for, for resumes, we really like to see things that are above and beyond just the traditional kind of again, more generalist approach. If you if you've done something like a project that really made you stand out. Put it in your resume, uh, put outcomes specifically, not just, yeah, I have, a, um, you know, I managed a caseload. I want to hear that you've managed a caseload of 35 or something like that, right? Like numbers help specific outcomes, or let's say if you had like a special project that had, um, you know, a, um, an outcome that you can quantify, we love, we love to see that. So those are some, you know, off the top kind of absolutes that we love to see. So for me, um, I would say your resume mostly is going to hurt you. And so you're mostly going to want to avoid putting things or doing things that draw attention away from you. For example, some four page resume where it talks about what you did in the Boy Scouts in 2010. It has nothing to do with this job. Page, yeah, resumes that are a page and a quarter. Like do some editing, get it down to a page if, or make it two pages, but I little attention to detail. Um, putting your GPA that was 3.05. Like, I don't want to know you were an average student, but if your GPA, if your GPA was 3.9, put it on there. If it was 4.0, put it on there. If it was 3.0, then I think, hmm, did they work very hard? Um, not 
trust me, my college GPA was 3.2. It was nothing special, but I don't write it on there. Um, I think things you can do to make your resume stand out, have them look professional, not look goofy, not have goofy fonts, not have goofy photographs, glamour shots. Um, having having um, relevant job experience. Now, I know a lot of the people we're hiring are straight out of college and don't have a ton of experience. That's okay. Include what you have. But um, I'd say a lot of times for me, it's more that a resume is likely to make me go, hmm, because of what's on there and weird rather than, you know, obviously if you went to Harvard and, and have worked 15 internships, put that on there. I'm going to be impressed by that. But you worked mowing lawns when you were 13 years old. I don't know that I need to know that one. I've seen many uh, resumes. Uh, so long uh, form and short form resumes. Uh, to me as a recruiter, I um, I don't care either way you want to give them to me. Um, the more information for me, the better. Um, to I would say things that I really like to see on a resume that don't actually um, necessarily get you higher compensation rate, better benefits or things like that, but it, it goes a long way is volunteer experience. Like those additional, like Kimber said, with the project, if you were on a project that you were a part of that wasn't necessarily part of your job, um, but that's like extra work that you're doing for your community, that's stuff that I wanna know. I want to know how you're you're volunteering um, your your time with your community. What are you doing outside of work? To yeah, um, volunteer work I love to see. But I'm basically I'm gonna look for. I want to see your education, your work experience, uh, not just like your job title, but what's your daily duties and descriptions. Um, so uh, there's. And future graduation dates for you, new grads, I'd love to see that this is my graduation date, May. If you just tell me you're in your master's, I don't know if I can start interviewing now or if we're like way too early. Um, so I love to see future dates. I'm fine with future dates. Um, I believe that you're, you're going to get that licensure. So, <laughs> How about you, Daniel? Uh, things that I look for, it's a combination of what everyone else said, uh, professional resume, relevant work experience, identifying specifically your responsibilities, um, outcomes that you may have been responsible for, if you had a case with like how many people, uh, different modalities of treatment that you are familiar with. Um, you know, for future graduation dates, we definitely look at that too, because we do factor that into the interview process. <clears throat> That's really what kind of draws my attention to someone's resume. Uh, and then usually I'll use that as I start crafting different questions in the interview process. Great. Justin, we have a qu question in this kind of um, maybe if you can just expand a little bit, uh, you started to talk about this, but there's a specific question. If we're applying for a job during a big transition period, um, example, before actually graduating and working on their licensure, a lot of things have changed around the licensure process this legislative session. Uh, what's the best way to talk about anticipated licensure in your application materials? So you originally said put graduation date if you're anticipating, but can you, anybody else expand on like some specifics for folks of how they might list that or where they might list that to call attention to that? Yeah, I just put it in with your other education, wherever you're listing your education, you put that you're an MSW graduate May, 2023. Um, yeah. If you're applying with the state, you actually have to click the button that says you graduated and then put in a note that says, I'll be graduating this date and the, and the HR analyst will catch that, at least for our agency. So if you say no, then you'll get weeded out automatically. 
So for anyone considering applying with us, know that. Just click yes, put in, and we have we interview plenty of people before they graduate. Um, so and then and then when you're scheduling, that's an excellent time to let let me or anyone know, like, hey, just so you're aware, I'm graduating uh, in May or whenever. So what I'm hearing is just in the various application materials, finding the appropriate place to disclose that it's an expected graduation and what that ex, uh, expect, expected graduation timeline is. Anything um, that, that Daniel or Kimber would like to add to that? Uh, I would say that that I, I think that comment about the state applications applies to the VA as well. Uh, there are often what we call the KSAs included in your application. So they're um, kind of knowledge-based questions and, and kind of uh, things that weed candidates out. And so I'd always, you know, not you don't want to ever lie on an application, but you know, mark yes. If you if you have the skills, you've had exposure, exposure to those skills, if you feel competent in them, mark yes. Um, and then, you know. We, you can talk about some of your kind of questions about those things within the interview, but always kind of sell yourself as a full competent person. Don't have any sort of, you know, um, I like to call it like imposter syndrome when, when filling out your applications, you know, represent yourself accurately, but, you know, don't, don't sell yourself short ever because sometimes you'll get weeded out, particularly with the, the very large, um, you know, like state or federal agencies, you just won't even get a chance to, to interview. So make sure that you are, you know, pushing, pushing the bounds you feel of your, of your confidence on those. Great. So I have, um, I, I, we want to make sure that we give the audience time to answer questions, but we still have about six minutes, but I have two questions that I want to get to. So I'm going to ask both of them and then maybe each of you choose which one resonates with you. And then I'll start because I have, um, I have one, they're related. The questions are related to each other. So the, the first question is, you know, what are some mistakes that applicants make? And then the other question is, what kinds of questions should people be prepared to ask in an interview? And the reason why I'm combining them together, because I actually think that is one of the mistakes that people make, is not coming prepared with questions to ask the in, the folks who are interviewing you. So I'll just kind of open it up to that. Mistakes and or types of questions folks could prepare for. Yeah, I'll jump in here. Um, I always say I, I like to hire, uh, hire for attitude, train for skill. Um, so I'm really looking for those skill sets, right? And then my manager, what they're doing, are you a cultural fit? Are you going to come in here and, and mesh well with this department? Um, those are kind of um, soft skills are hard to teach. <laughs> um, but so really just um, having those soft skills. Um, as far as questions that uh, to to ask or that are being asked. I guess we, our system is behavioral based questions. So we wanna, um, I'm looking at your skills. My managers are gonna ask you behavioral based questions, know how you react to situations. Yeah, I think um, what I was getting at is applicants. Uh, and I think some of that has to do with not preparing for the interview well. And so I think I, what I was doing is had an agenda a little bit here <laughs> about around the mistakes and around discussing how folks can prepare for their interviews. Um, I'm assuming you all, just like I have experience where maybe candidates came in less prepared than I had hoped. So maybe it's really around um, what can you do? What, what kind of pre preparation is needed and or um, examples of mistakes? I can start uh, on some of those. So Again, with the performance-based interviewing, um, there are lots of examples online. So I really encourage people to practice, like come up with some examples in your head. You know, you, you can look at, you know, kind of type, types of different questions that are asked and then come up with examples of how you would respond to those and maybe come up with like a list of some, you know, things that you're really proud of or some projects you could speak to or some difficult clients that you worked with that you could really like illustrate how you nailed that. Um, and so that you kind of have them on hand, no matter what questions asked, you can kind of formulate them into a specific example that you could use within a question. Um, 
another mistake that people make is not fully responding to the question. Oftentimes we have multi-part questions and people miss the big chunk of it, right? And we're actually scoring each question based on if it's complete or not. And so it's really important to take your time. You know, you don't, you don't have to just spit out your answer immediately. Like it's totally acceptable to us to look at the question, read it through, think about it, and then begin your response rather than just kind of spitting out um, what comes to your head. So um, oftentimes there are, you know, three or four, sometimes five parts to a question. So making sure you read through each one, say it and go on to the next question and make sure that you kind of by the end of your response have gotten to all, all of those. Sometimes they're timed as well. So time management can be really important. So if you know you have, you know, let's say five minutes to respond to a question, making sure that you don't spend four and a half on the first part of a question, right? And, and kind of make sure that you are able to answer each part adequately. Yeah, I, I would say rambling is a big one. You get people in who just ramble and ramble. And uh, the most common mistakes I see are people who don't show any personality. Um, I understand you're nervous. I, I, I actually like seeing that you're a little nervous. That being said, I, I, I want to be able to picture myself working with you. Um, so not showing it personality, not answering the questions like Kimber said. We send our applicants the questions before, and half of them act like they've never heard the question. If I've given you three days to look at the question, you should have the question memorized. You know what I mean? So those are kind of two common ones, but I think not being prepared. Another thing is they don't prepare for questions, just common questions. Honestly, you can Google what are common interview questions. You should be prepared to answer any of those. Tell us about yourself. Tell us about how you handle conflict. You know, these are questions that every company is going to ask some version. And prepare yourself for, tell me what your spirit animal is. Tell, like, these are questions companies ask to try to see if you'll laugh, if you'll chuckle a little, if you'll say that your spirit animal is a sloth, and then I won't hire you because I don't want a slow moving being. But whatever you say, right? Um, so. Just preparing yourself for kind of just what can happen in any interview is pretty valuable. Do a mock interview with your friend, your brother, whoever, your dog. Then your dog is, is interviewing you and just give, give it good answers. Daniel, we, we have uh, just about one minute to go to questions. And then obviously we can continue the conversation just depending on the nature of the questions as well. I think I'll actually kind of talk about questions that applicants can ask. Um, <clears throat> applicants who are really well prepared, they've gone over the job description. They have looked through <clears throat> the agency or organization's website. So they're very familiar with mission, philosophy, values. Um, questions that they pose to me in interviews that I really appreciate are, what are the hours of operation? What are like the, what's the daily responsibilities look like? Um, do you have an onboarding process? What does the onboarding process look like? Is supervision provided? Are there training stipends? Do you offer internal trainings? Um, are you involved with student loan repayment programs? How does the agency support work-life balance? What has your journey been like through the agency and working you know, for the agency at, at various stages? Um, is it possible for me to go and meet with someone who's currently in my role to kind of talk about what they deal with on a day-to-day -day basis? Questions like that, I really appreciate because it shows me that the applicant is really interested. They really want to go and gather as much information about us to ensure that we are a good fit for them, just as we're trying to go and determine, is this person a good fit for us? Exactly, Daniel. That's one of the reasons why I kind of wanted us to touch base on that a little bit is because in in my opinion, not only is I do I prefer to have the experience of uh, an applicant being well prepared and having really good thoughtful questions, but I actually believe that it's going to be a better situation for the folks who are who are hiring you and you if you have have done some thinking about this, if you've if you've 
thought about the types of things you'd like to know so that you can determine whether or not this will be a good fit for you. And I, and I realize that sometimes we, we just need jobs, but I think it's also helpful for knowing um, what you're getting yourself into, even if maybe it's not like the perfect or the, the job that you imagine yourself retiring from, but going in with open eyes and, and being curious. And, and it also shows to me a willingness to, uh, collaborate and ask questions and give feedback. And so I think that that is really helpful. One of the questions I think as we were on this topic that came up in the um, in the Q&A was, is it okay for applicants to take notes? For me, yes. I It is okay, in my opinion, for an applicant to take notes. If I am in a virtual setting and I know that means I'm going to be looking down or looking at another screen though, I, I, I know when I'm in, in online meetings, I let everybody know that that's what I'm doing. Hey, if you notice I'm looking in a different direction or I'm looking down, I'm taking notes just so that I can keep myself on track or I'm looking at the clock to make sure that I'm not, you know, going off on a tangent. Those things are all very appropriate in my opinion. Um, how about other folks? What do you think? Please take notes. Then I don't have to answer the question again. So no, seriously, I, my time is valuable. If, if you ask me what the hours of operation are and I tell you, and then next time we talk, you ask me again, well, you should have written that down. So yeah, please take notes, obviously during the appropriate time of the interview. Um, and, but yeah, no problem at all from my point of view. Well, we are getting ready to transition into the Q&A section. Um, Am I handing that to you, Jason, or you're just joining us? I'm I'm just joining us. Actually, I've got to leave in a couple of minutes. Okay. I know Danielle's going to close this out, but yeah, I'm interested in hearing from the audience. Any questions you might have? We'll give folks a few minutes to jump into the Q&A. And while we're waiting to see if any more questions come in, um, maybe I'm just going to open the floor to our panelists. What what are some things that maybe we haven't talked about uh, or something you might want to expand on in terms of just thinking about how students, how folks who are interested in applying at your agencies can think about setting themselves apart from other applicants, can be prepared for virtual or these hybrid type hiring situations? I, I would like to go back to uh, really just kind of doing your your own due diligence, you know, on your company that you're applying to, you know, know their mission, know their values. Uh, just uh, is this a place that you want to be? We're looking at, at you and we're trying to make that match, you know, is do you like us? Do we like you? Right. Um, so like just doing, you can check out glass door reviews. You can see what your own employees are saying about your organization. That'll give you a good uh, kind of insight. Uh, all of coming prepared with those questions. Um, that's, that's uh, huge. It just shows that you're interested. You've done, you've done your research into the, into the, uh, organization. Um, but yeah, uh, going back to rambling, this guy, I'm a rambler. So I, I don't, I don't know how to give you tips on not being a rambler. How do folks feel about um, thank you notes and emails? I have a very strong opinion about them. Um, that might actually surprise people, but I'm curious what other folks think. Necessary bug you I because I've heard people respond on all ends of the spectrum about thank you notes and thank you emails bug me but not bug me in a way that is going to hurt your chances at all so I think that it's like it's very low risk right um if I get one I just think oh that's 10 seconds I can't have back but I know that a lot of people want them so I don't know that it hurts you to send one. If I get, I, I, I don't care about it at all, to be 100% honest, one way or another. But some people do. So I think maybe it's probably just wise to do. I don't know. Yeah, I come, I, I actually have the same, a similar perspective. In fact, I wish that 
employers would stop with the unwritten expectation. If you expect somebody to thank you, you just say it in your application process that we, and then you'll see how silly it sounds to tell somebody that you expect them to thank you for giving up their unpaid time to meet with you for a job. Um, but with that being said, obviously I have my opinions about it. it. I think it can be an equity issue because not, and I can speak for myself, right? Like there are some cultural norms. My family is very blue collar. There are some no cultural norms. You know, my mom was a waitress. My, my grandma cleaned houses. Like they would not write a thank you note for getting hired for that shift. It's just not something that would happen. So there is some cultural things that can get in the way. And I also, like Void said, recognize that a lot of people have this unwritten expectation and unwritten role. So I always tell folks, follow up with an email. Follow up with an email as a thank you. It's not necessary for you to go run to Walgreens and get a thank you card and run back and give it to the person sitting at the front desk. Um, but that's my opinion. Other folks? Uh, from a recruiter standpoint, um, I have many managers in different boats. Um, I So I always ask that the candidate reach out to me and let me be that li liaison. And uh, yeah, if you want to reach... Uh, send them a thank you note, please send it to me. That manager might not like those and I might be doing you a favor. No, I, I said, I'll send those over for you. But sometimes my managers, they don't want to be pinged daily. Like where are we at? Where are we at? This is, that's, that's my job. Uh, so um, personally, yeah, I send me, send an email. Let me know what you want me to send them. Those managers, I'll bug them all day. I bug them all day, but it might hurt your chances. So let yes. me bug them. So don't find your hiring folks on LinkedIn and, you know, unsolicited thank yous at their LinkedIn profile, right? If you want to send a thank you, go through me, the the process that you went that you the however you were connected with in terms of setting up the interviews start with that that person because there's a person behind that um even if it's via email or an online system that's kind of what i'm hearing from folks and hopefully maybe my heart warms that maybe social workers look at this very different than some other industries um another question that came in was are there any questions that people should not ask during um, an interview? Uh, for us, I mean, I think I think it comes down to those soft skills that Boyd was mentioning too, right? I um, I think it's so we've had you know candidates that say kind of the wrong thing in questions, right? So um, being like really critical of an organization or um, maybe having having questions that make it seem like you're not a team player, right? Like, I think it's totally fair to ask about schedule and what it's like a day in the life, those types of things. But sometimes you can almost get a vibe of like, oh, this person is difficult to work with because they're asking a lot of very specific questions that they may not be a great fit, right? I think like everyone has said, we're really looking for people that are fun and easy to work with, right? Uh, personality fit probably more so than skill sets oftentimes. And so if we get a lot of questions that are kind of peppered with like, this is, and you, we get the sense of like, I will only work this way, or probably those could potentially go against you. Um, I, but, you know, like I think it for the VA, right? We're often in the news. So I think it's fair to ask about like current events or to say like, hey, I, I saw this thing happen, come up, like what's what's your organization kind of, you know, how, how are we, you know, Kind of responding to that, I think that's totally fine. So it's okay to have like, you know, critical-ish questions, but not about kind of nothing that illustrates that you're a difficult person to work with, if that makes sense. Like you can ask what your your organization's challenges, current challenges are without being like, so why did you guys go and do this? <laughs> I just think it's good advice when you're preparing for an interview to imagine that you are the person hiring yourself for that job. And what kind of questions would turn you off? I don't want you to be asking me about how many paid days off you get. 
I don't want questions that make you seem like you want to get out of work before you've even worked one day for me. While it may not, it may not disqualify you, it probably doesn't put you on the right foot if there's other good candidates, right? So I would say questions that make it seem like you want to get out of work and you do get those questions sometimes. And it's like, like I'll get questions about, uh, you know, tell me about if I have a baby, what you guys do. And, and that's perfectly fine for you to ask, right? But maybe ask it to me after you, I, you know that I want to hire you. You know what I mean? Um, because trust me, if I want to hire you, you can have 500 babies. I'll, I'll do whatever I can to keep you once I know I want you. And that was just an example. But there's all sorts of questions like getting time off. I, I don't mind benefits questions as long as they're generally like kind of generic ones. Because usually what I'll say is I'll resend you the link to the to the benefit package. Yeah. It's probably smart for you to have to already me. known that. Yeah. Yeah. And, and that's a good point, Boyd, because I think before you ask a question, don't ask a question just to fill up space, because I think probably most of us actually have some of that baseline information in our job openings, even at the RRC where we don't use like an online application portal. In our job description, we have a pretty baseline of what your hours will look like, that we're a hybrid uh, workplace, that we have you know, generous pay time off, et cetera. So it's not, so what I hear you saying, it's not so much that asking about benefits, but it's like, think about whether or not this is the appropriate use of the, our very limited quality time we want to have together to determine if we're even going to enter into an employment agreement together, and then maybe save the, ben the detailed benefits questions for when you're offered, when you're made an offer so that you can use that as part of your decision-making process. Is that fair? A fair way to talk about it? Yeah, I, I also would say, just to add to that, it's an opportunity to continue to like build relationships with the people that are interviewing you, right? Continue to um, you know, illustrate things that, you know, that you're on top of it, that you've done your homework and research, that you have an int vested interest in the organization, um, or, you know, or like, the trajectory, traje trajectory of the organization, something like that, because um, just kind of asking logistical issues, so it's, just, it's just not doing anything for anybody, right? So use it as an opportunity to kind of elevate yourself and your evidence of kind of like critical thinking and, and you know, hard, hard earned research. Okay, well, it looks like, well, let's see, do we have, do we have time for one more? Danielle? Do you want to wrap up here? I think we have time for one more, and I think that question is a good one. If if every if everyone on the panel has just a moment, D does everybody have just a couple of minutes? Are you okay? Okay. If the agency doesn't specify when they'll follow up with the applicant, is it okay for the applicant to ask the time frame the agency or employer will be making a hire decision for? Please, please, yes. <laughs> um, in fact, uh, I always ask uh, people to just get a hold of the recruiter, get a hold of wh whomever is uh, screening those resumes, get timelines, and, and connect with that recruiter. I'm going to be your advocate to help you find that, that match, what you're looking for, what my managers are looking for, and I'm here to make that match. So um, I love to be in contact with my candidates. They have all of my contact information. They can get a hold of me anytime, and, and, uh, and I'll get those like, uh, have they made a decision? I can go ask my manager where we are at in the interview process, and I can help facilitate those answers. Hiring takes a really long time at the VA. I wish it didn't. That's like a huge challenge that we face. So yeah, if you're still interested, we'd love to hear from you. Um, sometimes, uh, hopefully our communication is strong and, you know, between HR, it's, it's hard because we have like several steps removed. But if you haven't heard anything, like we would far prefer you reach out to us before taking another job or something, right? Um, so yes, uh, communication afterwards, particularly after you've been you know, selected as as the person that we're interested in working with, like, great, continue to bug us. Before then, you know, if they're still kind of making a decision about who they want to offer it to, I would hold off. Um, but, but if you have been selected, yes, please. 
Yeah. And I think it's totally fine to ask, even in the interview, what the process looks like. Sorry, I cut you off, Boyd. We just unmuted at the same time. But we were saying the exact same thing. Oh, okay. Well, great minds. <laughs> all right. Well, I'm. thank you, everybody. Thank you to all of our panelists and to those folks who are joining us live and who will be re uh rewatch or watching this in a different format i am now going to give the time back over to danielle awesome thank you so much to everyone who helped this uh, event come to pass we really appreciate each of our panel members um, boyd danielle kimber justin and sonia thank you very much for engaging in this discussion and giving us all these helpful tips i wish i had had all of this knowledge when I first started interviewing. Um, it would have been very helpful. Uh, we really appreciate your time and expertise. Um, thank you to all of you who are joining us today, um, as well as those who watch the recording later. Um, we hope you'll enjoy, uh, enjoy us again, joining us again, I should say, on April 13th to learn about the different types of benefits you should consider when offered a job, so kind of going on to the next step. Uh, you can find the details about that on our website and through the events page. Uh, so thank you again to everyone who participated. We appreciate it and have a wonderful day.